suggest to the scientific community that we are devolving rather than evolving. Well, uh, you're referring to the Burgess Shale and what's his name's book, Wonderful Life, right? Yeah. Uh, um, I, I sort of differ with your interpretation of it. It wasn't that these things were more complex than any life forms on the earth today. It was that they represented a large number of phyla, none of which exist on the earth today. So the point that was being made by the paleontologists is apparently we started out with many different phyla and then it narrowed at some point into just a few phyla, which then re-radiated out into all the forms we possess today. Uh, so I think um, other people have brought this up, and it's a troubling example because it tends to throw a railroad tie against the onrushing of my rhetorical freight train, but that's the name of the game, folks. Um, it probably is true that at, at an early point in the evolution of life, I mean, it's obviously now established, there were these many, many different phyla, and for unknown reasons, certain phyla became extinct, and then the, uh, the, what, well, the phyla which were left radiated and filled all the abandoned niches. Uh, that had previously been occupied by these now extinct organisms. But nevertheless, we have to look at this question of, for reasons unknown, they became extinct. Why did some phyla survive and others not? It would be inconsistent with the theory of evolution to suggest that this happened entirely by chance. There must have been some adaptive advantage possessed by the phyla that made it through whatever these narrow evolutionary necks were, and then the phyla which survived these climatological crises or whatever they are radiated into an incredible number of complex forms that nevertheless could be traced to a small number of earlier uh, phyla. Uh, a more in line with your the thrust of your argument, uh, a more difficult to answer objection that I don't know why I'm telling you this because it erodes my own position. But I was preaching this: the world complexifies through time. Rap at Esalen one time, and a guy was staying with me there who was a, a professional Russian translator. He was a Russian and a linguist. And he said, you know, there's a major exception to your rule that all phenomena complexify through time, and and that is language. He said, as we go back into the past, languages become richer. And I I am still puzzling over this. I don't think it's an inherent property of language. I think it's because as we go back into the past, languages become more and more localized and local variations develop in small confined geographical areas so that then when you pour all these languages together there tends to be a certain uh, uh, leveling and this probably uh, results in a uh, in a general uh, fall in the total number of words being used in a language. In other words, if in Canada they call a windshield a windscreen, and in England they call it something else, well then as long as Canada, England, and the U.S. don't communicate, we have three words for windshield. But if these three cultures communicate frequently and deeply, probably a couple of these words will become obsolete or colloquial, and one term will dominate. So uh, language is not evolving uh, uh, in a vacuum. You have to look at the effects of modern transportation, migrations of people, and that sort of thing. I agree that this is not, this complexification through time thing has the characteristic of a general tendency, but it's not an ironclad uh, natural law. 
we can see that now, for instance, uh, communism in the Soviet Union acted as a deep freeze for traditional cultures. Wonderful traditional cultures exist out on the steppes of Central Asia in Kyrgyzia, Turkmenistan, uh, Nagorno-Badakshanskaya, and these places. Well, these wonderful traditional cultures are probably now all trading in their colorful garb, vocabularies, and technologies for transistor radio subscriptions to Time Magazine and Der Spiegel, and generally lining up with the, the global leveling of culture that we see in the 20th century. So these are complex issues, and you're, you're right. It is entirely straightforward. Yeah. Do you mean the one to Prague or the one to Italy? <laughs> well, well, I, I went to Prague to the ITA conference, International Transpersonal Association conference in June, and uh, I had never realized till I went there. It was my second trip to Czechoslovakia. But, you know, as children, we grew up with a wonderful story of an emerald green country uh, farmed by happy munchkins and ruled from a beautiful capital city built around a splendiferous palace presided over by a wizard. And I realized Czechoslovakia is Oz for grown-ups. And... Uh, it, the morphogenetic field of the place is such that it might be a place we should all consider as a good venue for an archaic revival. <laughs> I think Prague in the 90s could be what Paris in the 20s was. It is, after all, the capital of old Bohemia. You may not know why we are called Bohemians. You don't have to have a Slavic gene in your entire family tree and can claim yourself as a Bohemian. It's because Bohemia stood for individual freedom, eccentricity, the magical arts, the practice of the art, and uh, the, a, a science which more gently approached the union of spirit and matter. And this whole... Our potential alchemical civilization based around Prague was destroyed by the Thirty Years' War. If you're interested in all this, you should read Francis Yates' book, The Rosicrucian Enlightenment, in which she shows that at a certain point in Western history, there was the possibility of a Protestant alchemical revival in Central Europe that was uh, bungled by a series of diplomatic and cultural misunderstandings and led instead to the Thirty Years' War, which then, if, you know, it, it, before the Thirty Years' War, Europe was thoroughly medieval in its character, really, and at the end of the Thirty Years' War, modernity was launched. I mean, the absolute power of kings had been replaced by parliaments and people, and Prague when the people who won the Thirty Years' War got down to redrawing the maps of Europe, they made sure that Prague fell on the wrong side of the language line and became a place that spoke a language spoken nowhere else in Europe, Czech, instead of the language that had been spoken there before the Thirty Years' War by the court, which was Italian. So it's a whole lost episode in Western history that... uh not too many people know about, but we could all return to our bohemian roots and create a community under the gentle aegis of Vaclav Havel and similar uh, uh, philosophically right-thinking people that might be a window of opportunity. We, You know, it's very important when you're trying to make social change that you find the proper resting place for your, your fulcrum, or a proper fulcrum for your lever, and the best place is outside the system that you're trying to move. And if we're serious about carrying on a major critique of American society, Prague might be an excellent place from which to do it, 
especially if by some nightmarish fluke of fate, uh, the knotheads currently in power are able to hang on. Sorry for that brief foray into politics. That, that's what Richard was trying to bait me into, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you several miles above where we are today. In a place called Decker County, there's a lost civilization with walls that surround the city and artifacts carved into the mountains that could not have possibly been from the Indians, the technology that they believe was a part of this lost civilization was from another world. Could you comment? on what your feelings are in terms of our planet being colonized by extraterrestrials in terms of Atlantis and Lemuria or the land of moon? Yeah, I can. I'm not sure how much comfort it will give you. Um, it seems to me an underwhelming proposition. In other words, if this happened, where is the evidence? Uh, you know, there have been fabulous civilizations existing in the past, but their artifacts, their buildings, their earthworks are available to be visited and seen. It seems to me, you know, in trying to build models, I try to follow Occam's razor. You all know what Occam's razor is? Hypotheses should not be multiplied without necessity. And I just find the, the lost continent thing um, an unnecessary hypothesis. I think there are lost civilizations, but I think we do a grave injustice to our dilemma and our accomplishment by thinking that anybody ever stood in this position before. To me, you see, there's an impulse that's very old in the Western mind to... Um, and strangely enough, I trade on it to some degree. It's called the nostalgia for paradise. And it's that we are always looking back to a lost golden age. And I think there was a lost golden age on the plains of Africa 15 to 20,000 years ago. I discussed it this morning. But I don't think high technology has ever existed before on this planet. Well, there's just no evidence of it. And the Atlantean people and the enthusiasts of Mur, Mur, Mu and Lemuria are always trying to fiddle with the date and say, you know, the Great Pyramid is 25,000 years old and there's a ruin on the Nazca Plain that's 50,000 years old. This is, first of all, the evidence is absolutely unconvincing. And second of all, the miracle is not how old the breakout into language and technology is, but how recent it I, is. I agree with you. I think that, um, you know, if you were to go scuba diving off of Bermuda and the Bimini Islands, you would find what many people believe are artifacts from Atlantis. You can hike in Decker Canyon and most of what is to be found is on the water because of the shift in the continental place 10,000 years ago or more. But many people believe that the UFO involvement in that civilization um, is still very active today. I know someone who I believe you met last night, Robert Stanley from Unicus Magazine. He takes people on these expeditions in Decker Canyon. He took somebody at the beginning of the summer and a raw film was shot the person was from the East Coast, I believe, in Boston, and he spaced on the development of the film. He just forgot about it, and he decided, okay, I might as well get this developed. And sure enough, hovering in the distance over this part of the canyon were 12 saucers. And it's a pretty obvious picture. I saw it last night for the first time. And I'm just curious because I think that a lot of us don't really deal with a lot of the information that's coming out right now because it's overwhelming. You know, it's almost like, wow. Well, I, I, I am prepared to be convinced, but I'm not willing to buy in without a fair amount of evidence. As far as UFOs are concerned, 
Um, I've thought a lot about it. I've seen them far away, up close, and it's not what people say it is. And the the problem, there, there are two phenomena. The UFO, who knows what that is, and then the UFO community. And my God, these people are much weirder than UFOs. <laughs> I mean, they, the, well, the whole slew of them. And the whole problem with the UFO community is apparently these people have never heard about the rules of evidence. I mean, they're just full of revelation after revelation with absolutely zip to back it up. There are so many, I mean, you look at these UFO magazines. Well, do you want to believe Master Chen Thuk of the Nabungi system? Or do you want to go with the the Billy Myers crowd or what's coming out of Brazil. Uh, I think Jacques Vallée in one of his books estimated that if you don't believe UFOs only appear where there are witnesses and uh, take the number of sightings seen by people and extrapolate that by the area of the surface of the earth, you have to conclude that UFOs are coming and going from this planet at a rate of 12,000 a month. Well, my God, what kind of extraterrestrial contact is this? That 12,000 a month for 50 years and never a definitive piece of evidence. I was talking to one of the researchers on the fetal abduction thing. I was all excited. He said to me, you know, I've talked to 500 women who claim uh, surgical removal of fetuses. And he said, and you know, the amazing thing, there's not a single uh, uh, sign of physical invasion of these women's bodies. And I said, well, Dr. X, doesn't this suggest something to you? And he said, yeah, advanced surgical techniques of which we have no knowledge. I said, well, yeah, but doesn't it, I mean, give me a break. So I think they have to operate in the light of the same evidence as everybody else. And their problem is that they claim to know too much. They're just willing to tell you, you know, 125,000 years ago, they arrived to grow sweet peas. And then 100,000 years ago, the project changed and the 11th planet did something. Too much. Too much data. It's too Jack Armstrong-ish. Do you believe our government has the technology to travel in ships to other stars? Do you think we're doing that today? Or do you think that's our future? No, I don't think we're doing that today. I mean, this is a, we have a government that can't, uh, knock off uh, a loudmouth in Baghdad, let alone travel to other stars. So you believe our space program is limited? Pardon me? program is limited to what? The reality of what's going on, and that basically, you don't think there's like an underground or a whole network of societies and organizations within our government that are involved in research and technology? Well, obviously, there is a black portion of the government where research goes on and probably fairly kinky things are carried out. But these people are no different from us. I mean, some of them may be here today. And I don't mean cops. I mean, you know, there may be NASA scientists here today that we are not so different from the people we're talking about. Human beings cannot keep a secret. You may bank on it. And so the idea that, you know, somebody possesses a technology thousands of years in advance of us, I mean, then when you actually tear the lid off some of these government black operations, you don't find super scientists and brilliant minds. You find people like Gordon Liddy and John Dean and, you know, half-wits, clowns uh, seem to lie behind most of this. I, I believe that no, I am not a conspiracy person. I believe that nobody is in control and that the people who seek control are the most misguided of all and that there's a great deal more than we don't know than we do know. And, uh, you know, I would love to be convinced that something really far out were happening. But it just always seems to come apart in your hands. These are, I, I consider stuff like the UFO phenomenon as popularly, um, commercially available UFO beliefs 
as basically viruses of language, diseases of understanding. If you could teach people about the laws of evidence and how you build a case and stuff like that, then people wouldn't be troubled by this. The same fuzzy thinking that permits people to believe in UFOs permits them to believe in the imminent uh, expectation of the second coming or, you know, the face of Christ appearing on tortillas and all of this stuff. Terrence, may may I stop here for a second? Uh, Is there a lot of people still with questions? Because they still have a lot of time. Well, at least till 6 o'clock, supposedly. Um, Can I have a show of hands? Okay, there's a few more because we want to sort of limit the questions to one question per person and, and sort of one rebuttal from that so that everybody could get a fair share before we um, make a final. This is a gentle hint to stop raving about UFOs. Don't make sure we're UFOs. You just want to hear any more about Oh, I see. Well, I'll, I say to the UFO people the same thing, you know, what can you show us? Drag it forth. Everything has to be judged on the same field. It, it, if you've got something, spill it. But to claim, you know, as I, I don't want to use names here, but stories like, well, we met the UFOs and they gave us a message from mankind, but when we got back to our car, our tape recorder had been miraculously erased itself. <laughs> well, then be quiet. Don't tell anybody this. Don't you understand how lame that sounds to the doubters? <laughs> It's it's not the believer you have to convince. They're a pushover. What are you going to do about your skeptics? That's the problem. Well, you want me to tell you a story? Yeah. I was in the Amazon. Um, I was in a state of considerable psychic turmoil. And uh, I sat up all night. This is told, by the way, in the book, True Hallucinations, which will be published next year. And uh, at dawn, I looked across this lake, and there was a thin line of clouds on the horizon. And uh, I watched this line of clouds, and they were, and then suddenly I noticed that they were turning in place, like a pencil spinning on its axis in one place, and then the clouds uh, this line of clouds broke apart into four perfectly identical lenticular clouds. And then the lenticular, the four lenticular clouds merged into two lenticular clouds. And then the two merged into one. And as they merged into one, I, I heard the, the whee, whee, whee sound of Hollywood science fiction flying saucers, and I realized this thing was coming toward me across the lake. And it was absolutely convincing. It was a flying saucer, the real thing. And, and I, I was absolutely convinced that it was going to take me at that moment. And as it passed over, only about 200 feet above my head, I could see it clearly enough that I could see rivets on its underside. I could see its running lights. I could see it. But you know what I saw? I saw the end cap of a 1932 model Hoover vacuum cleaner. It was the very same flying saucer that George Adamski suspended from a piece of mylar fishing line in 1953 and photographed in his garage one of the most famous UFO hoaxes of all time. I saw it a diameter of 40 feet over the Amazon basin, and I knew what I was looking at. It was uh, more disturbing than if it had been a ship from Zeta Reticuli, because it had built-in cognitive dissonance. Uh, what? If it's a very short story. <laughs> You're in the jungle.
Well, see, I, I believe you completely. I don't have any problem with that. It's simply an enormous leap to say that that was a craft from another star. It's much better to just say it's a who knows what it is. The world is full of weird stuff. It, just briefly, here's my best theory on flying saucers and a whole bunch of other stuff that tries to solve all problems of this sort simultaneously. The transcendental object at the end of time, let's drag it in here, and let's imagine that it is like those mirrored balls that they hang in discos above the bar and spin. So then I think that Definitely, there is a forward movement of causal necessity, which propels us from the past into the present, on into the future. But that there is also, and necessary to account for precognitive visions and stuff like that, which happen all the time, a flow of information from the future into the past. And the transcendental object at the end of time is casting reflections of itself backward into the past. And if you are struck, whatever that means, by one of these scintillas from the transcendental object at the end of time, then you begin to cure and teach. And if you really got a good hit, possibly raise the dead. I mean, I'm not sure how far it can go. Now, also, these these images of the transcendental object at the end of time haunt the skies of this planet in the form of spinning vortices of contradiction. This is what Jung said. He said, you know, the UFO is an image of the self. And I don't mean the little self. I mean the collective self of humanity. So a story like Jim's story is, I have no problem with it. I take it as true. It's the people who say, you know, and they revealed the nature of the fall of Atlantis and the world plan. Then it's too much because it's coming through human interpretation. The horrible thing about the UFO people who claim contact is that the the aliens they present to us are so incredibly mundane. So much more mundane than what you would encounter on a DMT flash <laughs> that they're just like the neighbors next door. Uh, I think that, you know, alien intelligence, the trick is not to find it, but to recognize it when it's in front of you. Intel intelligence is a very slippery concept. Sometimes we can't even identify it in the person sitting next to us on the bus. So how can you expect to identify the intelligence of an alien? It, it just seems incredibly unlikely to me. I think the world is a lot stranger than we suppose without evoking benevolent aliens who prefer vegetarian diets and who come from the stars. I mean, why do they so fit our preconception of what they would be? 
I mean, silvery humanoid, uh, alien intelligence and alien life, when and if you meet it, you'll know you're in the presence of the real thing because you'll be barely able to wrap your mind around it. Yeah, I'm basically kind of pondering over the idea of my, of my earlier question about, well, if we perceive these as being aliens, that's one thing. But what happens if, in fact, these humanoid creatures that we're defining are us traveling back through time and, and being able to materialize our, through, our, through the, the future technology? Then we're talking about something different. I'm not saying that this is true. This is only, you know, part of my own you know, speculation. Well, it's an attractive that, idea. Yeah, it it raises exactly. problems, as I'm sure you're aware, sure. the grandfather paradox and so forth and so on. Uh, but it, it, it's a possibility. I think it's more likely that these are emissaries from the land of the dead yeah. than from the Pleiades. Right. And that if, since they speak English, since they look humanoid, since they seem to care about us and our technologies and so forth, they seem remarkably human. Well, maybe they're concerned about their own state of well-being. Maybe somehow it's related to to the the you know what's going on here now and what the outcome is going to be. Maybe that's going to somehow affect the way they are. You know, I mean, we've seen it in in Star Trek. You know, I mean, the idea is. No, the idea is of, of, you know, people coming back from the future to, to, you know, I mean, there is a paradox obviously involved in it, so it is, it's, it's a lot of our imagination at work. But at the same time, at the, at the same, in the same ideas, you know, maybe there's a certain sense of reality about it. Maybe there is, maybe there is. It could you know, be a holographic projection out of the guy in mind. Yeah. It could be, uh, you know, a race of intelligent saurians that rose and fell before the asteroid impact that wiped out the dinosaur. It could be all and everything. The trick is to try and get some kind of evidentiary hold on it. Yeah. Uh, this is a nut and bolt question. Um, but first I'd like to preface it by saying that I haven't used psychedelics in 20 years and uh, haven't used marijuana in seven, and am, have been considering a uh, return to the use of psychedelics. And um, when I stopped the last experience which I had, it wasn't a terrifying experience, and it wasn't a bad trip. It was um, similar. It presents similar insights that I have heard you mention and speak of. But there were times in which my psychedelic use um, left me uh, rather shaken and terrified, um, dealing with um, fear of death and crossing over the line. Though I have to say that my very first psychedelic experience was one which contained the death and rebirth experience. So I don't know why after that, but that's the nature of fear, I suppose. Um, so the question is, it's a nut and bolt question, it's um, uh, how does one proceed with the use of psychedelics after a long absence from it and uh, not make the mistakes and not run into the walls um, that I occasionally ran into. And or and or deal with them, get around them, um, so forth and so on. Well, I think the best protection against unpleasant experiences on psychedelics is to do it with care and attention in environments that are safe and low on sensory input. In other words, you don't take it and go to a crowded singles bar or even a rock and roll concert. I mean, if you have to combine psychedelics with rock and roll, do it with low doses. Well, this is the way to do it. It isn't always going to be ecstatic, but it's, al it's almost always guaranteed to be educational. There's no way you can seal yourself off from shock, because shock may be what you need. Uh, but you can attention to it. I mean, fasting, going into it, cleaning yourself up, 
creating a safe space, not going to it if you've just been highly agitated by some emotional upheaval in your life, and then take a long time to integrate it and think about it. It's basically, in the best sense of the word, a religious activity. And it's in, and the intellect or whatever it is that lies behind it is very sensitive to your needs and your limits. And unless you approach it with a cavalier attitude, it will usually be very gentle with you. Now this fear of death thing though is a hard thing to come to terms with because um you know, it's we are going to die. It's scripted into the human experience. Culturally, there's a great deal of anxiety around this. And basically, I think what one has to do is simply ride it out in terms of advice as to what you do once you have, are, are in the middle of an unpleasant revelation. Um, you can sing your way through that, you can smoke cannabis to, to shake up the pieces on the board, uh, or and you can just wait and put up with it. It's the, the real issue you see around fear on psychedelics is a surrender issue. The ego plays a trick on you because the ego begins to dissolve under the influence of the psychedelic and... Uh, The ego sends you the message, you are dying. (laughs) This is its last most desperate ploy to halt what is happening because the ego is dying. And to the degree that you identify with the ego, you'll be driven into a state of panic. A joke about the Lone Ranger and Tonto are surrounded by Indians and the Lone Ranger says, well, it looks like the end of the trail, partner. And Tonto says, uh, or he says, it looks like the end of the trail for us, partner. And Tonto says, what mean us, pale face? <laughs> A point and wish it luck. And it is, in fact, dissolved. Um, and you can sing. It will respond to being sung to. I am always, I am terrified of psychedelics. I never take them without a sense of sickening dread for being Because I figure, you know, I stand up in front of people and preach this stuff, and if it wants to get me, it will really get me good. And what I say to it when I take it, I say, I, I am surrendering, I am surrendering myself to you completely. Do what you will with me. Please don't hurt me. And if you must kill me, please do it quickly. And, uh, but I, I know people who have tried to order it around. Heavy male dominator types who want to beat information out of it. And my God, they have bad trips so terrifying that they never come back to it again because if it decides to turn on you, it has resources that would make your hair stand on end. So easy does it gently, reverently, and with a great deal of attention. I have some questions. I have some things that are given to me. Correct. Field. Um, Seven years ago, on my birthday, I still have them. Would they would they still be any good? Did you keep them in a dark, cold place? Uh, for two years, and then I moved on to a boat, and so but they're in a dark place. Well, the way to tell is if they are still, if the seal was so good that they are still cracker dry, as dry as a fresh saltine cracker. They're probably all right, but what tends to happen with mushrooms under the best sealing conditions is they resorb water. And if it's rubbery at all, or even bendable, then it's probably degraded and it's not any good anymore. 
Another thing, let me say before I leave this, if you're really serious about taking this into your life and you really want insurance mm-hmm. against uh, unpleasant experiences, then learn to grow them. Mm-hmm. This catapults you into a whole different category of relationship to it because it gives special privileges to growers. It's like premier class on United Airlines or something. You get to board first and you get a wider seat and a better meal and a good movie. So, uh, and if you can grow it, it will teach you the qualities that you must have to take it, which are attention to detail, sensitivity to incremental changes, uh, scheduling, cleanliness, so forth and so on, and will reform your character sufficiently that you can then probably take it without fear. Yes, this lady over here. To my children about this, I have an 11-year-old daughter and a 14-year-old son. I talk to them exactly the way I talk to you about it. I say there are good drugs and bad drugs. There's no such thing as the drug problem or the drug issue. Part of the way the establishment has muddied the water is by impoverishing our language about these things. Name a drug and I'll tell you what I think about it and how you should relate to it. Uh, I've seen people destroy themselves on cocaine, heroin, alcohol. I've seen people get nutty behind tobacco, uh, religion, fascist politics fundamentalism, uh, and I say, you know, if you're going to take a drug, and if, and if you want to take a drug, talk to me about it. If you want me to take it with you, and I think it's a, a worthwhile drug, I will. If I don't think it's a worthwhile drug, I will tell you why. But it will be a real reason, and you will find out that I'm not putting you on, and I haven't had any problem. I think we are we infantile, not only infantile lives, not only our children, but ourselves on this issue. Some drugs are bad, some drugs are good, some drugs are trivial, and then there are styles of taking drugs. The way I think psychedelics should be taken is it's a, it's a kind of paradox, rarely and at high doses, so that you never are comfortable I'm not peddling comfort here. I'm peddling revelation. So you must take what are called heroic doses. More than you want to take, that's the correct dose. And less frequently than you want to take it, that's the correct time. And then each time it will blow your mind to shreds and positively feed into the rest of your life. There is the people who think people who take psychedelics are into escape don't know what they're talking about. I mean, escape into what, for crying out loud? Uh, I mean, the, the heavy narcosis is going on in front of the boob tube and imbibing, you know, the daily newspaper and that kind of thing. So it's basically you've got to level with your kids ever more so now because uh, lying has become official policy, you know? I mean, I can't believe the crap I see on television in these anti-drug ads. Uh, marijuana is the gateway drug to hard drugs. You know, tobacco and alcohol are the gateway drugs to hard drugs. Don't let anybody teach you. And so forth and so on. So it's a matter of informing ourselves and then informing our children and then teaching them how to do these things. It's a lot like sexuality. When nobody mentioned it, you learned in the gutter. And that usually meant that you got your girlfriend pregnant at age 19 and had a shotgun marriage and lived a life of agony and repression in the service of phony social values from that point on. We have to educate ourselves. Our sexuality, our psychedelic psychology, all the rest of it, we have, we, you and I, not our children, have been tremendously infantilized by uh, our government. I mean, think about the just say no slogan. What that means is 
Don't think about it. Don't inform yourself. Uh, just say no. Behave, in other words, like an idiot. Uh, this, this is not serviceable. And, uh, pardon me? Yeah, why ask why? The, the empowering of institutional ignorance. It's uh, unconscionable. This is the kind of art. These people make such a strong argument for the legal uh, regulation of advertising that they would do well to step back. Or they may find themselves in a situation that they find very uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. I mean, freedom of speech is not freedom to subvert uh, the human enterprise. Freedom of speech is uh, freedom to advocate and to argue and to respond to arguments, but not to stack the deck against truth and clear thinking and relative truth. No, no. If, if nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. <laughs> I'm, I'm a recovering alcoholic, and I've been to and used psychedelics several times. I'm being human and not being able to secret. I, I told this to my sponsor in, in, in a couple of weeks ago, and she's showing it. Um, listen, I, I don't feel that it's a problem or that it's taken away anything by anything that's a sponsor, but I'm having a hard time articulating to her why I don't see this as a problem. I was wondering if you could, um, if you could address how to reconcile the use of psychedelics within drug set programs and I've heard that there are, I heard it in another workshop, I've heard that there are people doing this, and I wonder if you... I don't want to name names, no. but the top people in AA are entirely pro-psychedelic. They, they have told me this. Uh, addiction, repetitious abuse of substances has very little to do with this. Where I differ with the AA, as it's generally presented, is the idea that all things are to be looked at the same. Again, this Luddite approach, where you simplify no matter how much damage it does to the complexity of the issue. A 12-step a, a program is another form of infantilization. Uh, the whole idea of addiction as disease is a way of lifting responsibility off people. After all, if heroin addiction is a disease, then it's just sort of like the flu or gonorrhea. It's something that's happened to you and it's very unfortunate, but you don't need to examine your own attitudes or psychology. This is, in fact, what we need to do. We have to take responsibility for our actions. And I think the, that the 12 step thing is way out of control at this point because there's a 12 step program for everything. I think, uh, you know, responsible activity, whether you're talking about drugs or managing your finances or your sexuality, there's no substitute for it. And you can't have a set of rules that will be sufficiently sophisticated to be a working substitute for intelligent decision making. A lot of times, 12 step offers a diversion to it. Like a lot of times, you know, this, I, have, I have a friend who's also been in the program for five or six years, and he's so convinced of, of, of the whole thing about the Bible and the whole prophecy and everything that he basically an alcoholic still. He hasn't come to terms with the problems yet at all. I mean he's the same the same person with a, with with only one substance less than he had than he had before. There's no substitute in politics, in psychedelics, in sexuality, in UFO hunting. There's no substitute for clear thinking and a reasonable knowledge of the rules of evidence. And if somebody's pushing some form of hype at you, you need to have your crap detector out and working because there's a lot of crap out there. And some of it well-intentioned. It can be well-intentioned and still lead you down the primrose path. So what do you do about this new discovery about um, genetic age controlling? They're going into them. 
Gen gen genetic genetic form. designing and um, preventing AIDS and or prolonging aging. You mean life extension? Yeah. I mean, it's inevitable. Do you, what do you feel is going to happen with that? Well, so many things are happening at once. This is just part of the mix. Uh, I don't think we want to live forever. I mean, somebody said death is nature's way of making room for next year's model. And there's something to be said for that. I really think that death is what it's all about. And that, uh, you know, the body is the placenta of the soul. And the purpose of life in three-dimensional space is to build up this invisible organ called the soul so that it can make a, a clean flight back to its point of origin once severed from biology. I, I don't think we should cling, you know, to anything. Everything flows. This is here. Let me give you the one thing I've learned out of life and drugs and everything else. It's a hard truth. It's an illuminating truth. Heard correctly, it brings a smile to your lips and a tear to your eye. Nothing lasts. Nothing lasts. There are no exceptions to this. Your relationship to your lover does not last. The hatred of your enemy does not last. The wonderful home you worked so hard to create, it doesn't last. Your body doesn't last. Nothing lasts. Everything is in the process of being transformed and replaced by something else. You have to embrace that or life will disappoint you, embitter you, and tear you to pieces. I like to make an analogy to searching. The, the, per, the, the uninformed person thinks that when you enter the sea, you're safe near the shore. You're not safe near the shore. That's where the waves are breaking and creating the white water and the undertow. All surfers know that you have to swim out to where the waves are forming cleanly in deep water. And then you can catch the wave and ride it into the beach. But if you, if you, if you hold to the shore, you'll just be beaten to death in the incoming surf. That could be the end of the workshop as far as I'm concerned. How it works. Well, because uh, science has so thoroughly convinced us that the yawning grave is the end of the story. It's, it's presented as the absolute terminus of your existence. When in fact, I believe, I think I said this last night, this is as dead as you can get. This, you know? So the challenge is not how to face death. The challenge is how to come to terms gracefully with the prospect of eternity. But it is constantly transforming. Right, but, but on, on the deepest level, pure spirit, that is probably something that has read through all of time, you know, beyond well, it's outside of time. Yes, you can exit time, and then you exist in, in, in eternity. Yeah. Reincarnation. Um, again, the evidence is inconclusive. There is some evidence, you know, stories, we all know them. But the idea that it happens to everyone seems an unnecessary hypothesis based on the idea that it happens to some people. Uh, I would like to think that we move on. I would like to think that uh, there is a kind of ascent through existence. I'm open to the possibility of reincarnation, but again, underwhelmed by the evidence. See, maybe I should say a little bit about my my own psychology because I always get into these wrangles with people. I'm sort of presented as 
a person on the fringe of the new age or something like that. I don't consider myself a new ager at all. I got where I am through doubt, skepticism, uh, lack of belief, hard-headed reason. And I've gotten, I believe, further into weirdness than the channelers, the people who are talking to the UFOs and all the rest of them. They're such pushovers. I mean, the first uh, voice that comes along from the invisible world, and they're ready to sign on to whatever gibberish is being put. I think you can be a rationalist. I think you can demand hard evidence. And and still, this will not push magic out of your world. Real magic doesn't demand dewy-eyed believers offering sacrifice at its altar. The real magic is real. It exists for skeptics, not believers. So the the technique is not to believe is not to stay in your comfortable cultural situation and believe the first weird rap that comes down the pipe or the second or the third. The way to do it is to be hard headed, rational, demanding, but it's Explore edges. Push the edges. Within, and also within the world. So if you hear that someone in India can raise the dead, fly to India. Put yourself in front of them and say, would you please raise the dead? And if they say, oh, I only do it on Tuesday, or come back in April, or you're not ready, then you just put them in the fraud column. <laughs> and, 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 and this has always worked for me. I just say, you know, you say you've got the whammy. What can you show me? I went to India. But to, I mean, don't get me started. Uh, it is, it is a, 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 a spiritual uh, bargain basement of the sleaziest sort. I went to South America with the same question. What can you show me? And the guy said, well, let's sharpen our machetes and we'll go out here a half a mile into the forest and we'll cut some of this vine and we'll bring it back and brew it up and I'll show you what I can show you. None of this kiss my feet, sweep up around the ashram ten years, memorize 50,000 lines of the Avakatsamka Sutra or that kind of malarkey. If there's any assumption of hierarchy, Head for the door. If somebody's telling you that you're little and they're up, head for the door. It's a con of some sort. It's just, it's a horrible, horrible con. The real, the real stuff is available to those who ask for it. You don't have to prove yourself. Asking is sufficient. And none of these can compete with psychedelics. That's why they inveigh against it so furiously and tell you that it'll rend holes in your aura and all the rest of the malarkey that is brought against it. I mean, give me a break. So the, the thing to do is explore edges, push hard, and then use your ordinary good sense to tell shit from Shinola, and you will move much faster than the people who are worshipping at the feet of this or that beady-eyed weasel who set himself up with a non-profit foundation and a line of bunk that's being published by the devoted slaves and peddled in airports or whatever. I mean, that's just horrible, all that stuff. Horrible. In response to something that was said earlier, uh, I've been fascinated with psychedelics since my first experience when I was 17, and... I, you know, have struggled with finding out about the mechanics of painting and growing mushrooms. And over the last couple of years, I've finally met with some, uh, with relative success. And I just like to offer if there's anybody who sincerely, you know, has, I mean, it's a frustrating process when you first start. If there's anybody that, you know, is seriously interested, I'd be glad to give them a little help.
this is an incredibly generous offer. It's very hard to learn to grow mushrooms unless someone shows you how. My book that I wrote with my brother is the best we could do, but it's like reading the instructions for putting together an electric train or something, you know. If somebody will just show you, it becomes transparent. So nobody has ever said this at any workshop I've ever been. If you're interested, do not let this gentleman slip through your fingers. That's a book that's available. Uh, trying to think of the guy's name. Anything that's called the the Famous? Of the book? Yeah, the title of it's The Mushroom Cultivator. By Paul Stamen. But even at that, there's no substitute for somebody at your elbow showing you uh, how to do it. Thank you for twisting me off the anti-guru tirade. Have you ever met any of the fellows from your company here, from the tradition, and so on? Respect? Well, I make a differentiation. I'm not saying that the Hindu tradition or the yogic tradition is is phony. I'm saying that uh, we misconstrue its intent. What these traditional teachings deliver, if they are working right, is they deliver wisdom about how to live. That's what a great guru can teach you. And I don't, and that's not what I'm trying to teach you. We're talking here about using psychedelics to blow ourselves into another dimension. Uh, we need, this goes to the question hours ago about the role of psychedelics in the spiritual program of advancement. I don't claim that you will become a spiritually advanced person. I don't know what a spiritually advanced person is. What I claim is that you will contact an in, a, a dimension of experience inaccessible by any other means if you will pursue this. And then you may decide that that's fine. You verified that everything I said is true or true enough. And now you don't ever want to do that again and go on with your life. Or you may be able to make some good of it. Uh, it is not... It is no substitute for ethical activity or moral sensitivity. It is no substitute for moral sensitivity. Moral sensitivity, you don't cultivate in silent darkness in your bedroom with the telephone unplugged. Moral sensitivity is visit the sick and imprisoned, heal the sick, bury the dead, instruct the ignorant. That's what moral sensitivity is about. And people don't want to hear that. They want to go off and worship at the feet of some guru. What could that possibly have to do with moral advancement? Moral advancement is care for your fellow human beings, for crying out loud. It's far more Mother Teresa than Ramana Maharshi, as far as I'm concerned. Not to knock Ramana Maharshi, but, you know... You know, in the whole, you get this in the fascination with shamanism in the New Age. Shamanism in the Aboriginal context is primarily about curing the sick. That's what it's about. Not these wild, grandiose, technicolor scenarios. My God, you can read 14,000 pages of Carlos Castaneda and nobody ever cures anybody of anything. It's all happening in this other uh, dimension. So it all comes down to pretty, pretty nitty gritty hands on here and now stuff. Yes. Um, I noticed that after a hallucinogenic activity and you're by yourself or you're seeing your inmates, a, a sort of a empathetic consciousness happens to where you're more in tune with the surroundings, the animals and the plants as though they could enter and to speak to your consciousness and you can sort of with them. I wonder if anyone else experiences that or if it um, derives from just doing mushrooms and not the other one. It seems like a more organic, like like a messing of information that's coherent in everything that exists, that's alive, that you tap into, that feeds into you also and you affect the surroundings somewhat. The animals and everything sort of are affected by your presence in being there. 
Well, this is what I call this reestablishing of the relationship to the Gaian mind. This is what the ego blocks us from, is the, is this relationship to nature as though it were a kind of partner and a companion. You know, the whole problem with the modern situation, I mean, earlier I defined it as ego, here's then a behavioral definition of it. Our problem is that we cannot feel the consequences of what we're doing. We can talk about the spread of AIDS, the ozone hole, the toxification of the ocean, but if we could emotionally connect with it and feel we would have the political reformation we're waiting for later this evening. So, it, it, and what you're talking about, I think, is the feeling that comes when nature is suddenly perceived to be vibrant, alive, full of an intent to communicate, and caring of humanity. Uh, women, I think, are closer to this than men. But in the context of our civilization, we're also screwed up that comparing the differences between men and women in regard to that hardly matters. We have to re-empower our emotions. We've gone way out of line in terms of, of the rational mind and have completely deadened our emotional receptors to the consequences of, of what we're doing. Yes. Um, there's a, one thing you mentioned earlier about conspiracy, conspiracy theory and that describes me to that directly. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last. You had mentioned about conspiracy yeah. theory and that describes me to it directly as a theory, and I can appreciate that. But I think we have to look at it in more detail and maybe from some other angle to get more out of that. Maybe the uh, terminology doesn't fit. But... In the 60s, having lived through that era, we, I think, really touched on what democracy could be. It really was a different relationship between people for a short period of time. And I remember how it dissolved as the 60s went on and the 70s came, and what we've all experienced to the remainder of the 70s into the 80s and now the 90s. I think it's been a um, very dramatic change. I think that to describe that its happenstance would be folly. To say completely that the CIA, as an example, although I have no information and don't even want to have it, tested something and then let it go because it didn't fit their needs completely may not be the whole story. For example, you talked about drugs, natural especially, um, but drugs in general can be inhabited as time goes on by those who experience it. And let's say, for example, as a theory, that those who experienced that democracy early in the 60s were inhibited from further experiencing, were disassociated from it by safe houses, by whatever systems were developed, such that those drugs could be inhabited in a different way over a period of time. Rather than resulting in democracy, perhaps they result in brave new world or some system of control. It seems to me like there may be a theocracy rather than a democracy that's ruling, and that there may be a thought process that is guiding. And one of the reasons we see these when we look inside of these institutions, like um, the Center for Disease Control, the National Institute of Health, the White House, one of the reasons we see these bungly people is because those are the only people who really can fill these roles, not because there is nothing of intelligence behind that's guiding them. And by say, when I say intelligence, I don't mean positive intelligence. So I feel like we have to, it would be helpful for us to keep in touch with the idea of something going on, something guiding and counter-guiding. That, um, as you said about evolution earlier, that evolution really is the, uh, moving toward a goal. I think that those who plan for 500 years in the future, and there are people that do that, and those that may have a theocracy may see that goal and not want that. They may not want the free use of materials on this planet to flow freely between all people. Once that happens, you have whatever democracy truly is. I mean, even that would transform to a new word, a new name. 
So I feel if there is something going on, I feel that psychedelics do allow one to penetrate through the veils that are created. I think that's why they're detrimental. That's why they're a quote-unquote controlled substance. You know, in the medical schools and in the research field, the reason there's so much cowardice and fear is because people lose their jobs. Literally, they don't even know why they lost them. You go to the UCLA Medical School Library and read in some of the more technical journals on synthesis and other areas related to this, you will find in the corners of the book people's notes about what their experiences were. That's the source of information. That's where it's being spread. It's the only panel open. There are people all across this nation and elsewhere trying to do things. They have no avenue, and if they step out, they're cut off. Same way as in cancer therapy, the same way as in other areas where this powerful dynamic life that we are could emerge. I think it's a theocracy behind it, something that's known. Um, so I just want to present Well, that. I think there are a lot of um, groups, let's say, that aspire to control society. I just don't think anybody is succeeding. I don't think that the world we're living in is the result of anybody's conscious agenda. Uh, to take LSD, for example, and again, I always go back to Occam's razor. The simplest explanation for what happened to the psychedelic revolution in the 60s is that it self-corrupted itself. It didn't require the CIA to ruin it. When you have a situation where a, a, a graduate student in biochemistry and his roommate with a trust fund can get together and pool their money and intelligence and over a long weekend produce five or ten million hits of LSD in a small apartment, what you are going to get out of that is criminal syndicalism pyramidal organizations for the purposes of making money. And that is clearly what destroyed LSD. I mean, I lived through it. The San Francisco Oracle and, and people like that were pleading, don't sell acid. Give it away. Give it away. As long as you give it away, it will be pure. And some people weren't interested in enlightenment. Some people wanted, you know, houses in the hills and Maseratis. So it, it is our own nature that conspires against us, not the, the dreams of the CIA. I mean, don't forget, George Bush once ran the CIA, for God's sake. That's the level of competence that that is. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Because I think you are going to talk to you. So but why hypothesize it if there's no evidence for it? Well, people decided they wanted to make money on it. What was it primarily? Control, Control of what? Well, you would yourself and say, you know, But these things were distributed in microcultures relative to the global situation. I mean, I, I don't deny that there are people who seek to subvert the natural development of the social agenda. I just think that they uh, uh, it's an impossible proposition. I mean, the real conspiracies are the Catholic Church, the World Bank, the IMF. And they don't think of themselves as conspirators. They think of themselves as thousand-year-old organizations, shepherd, not in the case of the IMF. But Say what? They're the ones that decide. Oh, they don't decide. 
Don't give it to that let me Well like let let Richard has the talking. So how's it uh let you take what came the middle of the night on Wednesday night, get the full load conspiracy story from Dave Emery. And I think actually there's a lot to be uh listened to very carefully in terms of the evidence that he has gathered about this. But don't you think, Richard, that even if we could almost say, even if all these conspiracies exist, we're hearing about so many that they must be self-canceling. Well, it's coming to crisis moment in terms of the massive cover-up versus the keep uncovering this and uncovering that and... They just can't keep their fingers on every part of the dike. Yeah, I think so, uh, running a world-controlling conspiracy must be a fairly frustrating enterprise these days. I'm getting the high sign from the papers. Uh, let me... Listen, I, got, I, got, I just want to speak to this lady's concern about LSD. LSD was used in the 60s for alcoholic rehabilitation very successfully. And, single doses. And only, sure. it, you know, when the government put its hand, its thumb on LSD research was this stop. But they had tremendous success with LSD in recovering alcoholics in, in the straight uh, psychiatric hospital. So there is that evidence. Huh? We, there has to be an overcoming of the institutionalized fear that is exported into the society. The news is this, the psychedelic dimension represents a new world. And, you know, we can go into it and enslave the Indians, or we can go into it and save our souls. And it's going to be guided and controlled, I think, by the informed decisions of rational individuals. And, and, uh, it's, up to each and every one of us to make sure that we fall in to that category. This is the best kept secret on this planet. It is your birthright, as much your birthright as the sexual experience, but more easily uh, evaded, more easily distorted. And so there's a certain responsibility on each of us to try and educate and inform ourselves and then integrate it into our lives. We no more know what it's for than we know what electricity or wind is for. It can be used for all kinds of things. It can be used to uh, distort human nature or to unfold it into some kind of incredible and amazing future. These things used to be called consciousness expanding drugs. Well, now suppose for a moment that that were actually true, that that's what they do. If if consciousness does not loom large as a part of the human future, then what kind of future is it going to be? If these things really empower consciousness, self-reflection, boundary dissolution, and creative ideation, then we must fully explore them because we are on the brink of extinction because of a failure of creativity, a failure to creatively meet the challenges that history, our own history, has created for ourselves. We have to claim our birthright. Nobody can take this away from you any more than they can take away your right to have sex or breathe air or drink water. And anybody who tells you that this is an item up for uh, social manipulation and control is somehow serving a dominator uh, agenda that diminishes and degrades every single member of the human family. Uh, It is a true mystery. It's a doorway out of the dead end of Western history. It's the return path backward to the shamanic paradise that existed before history. If you don't believe what I'm saying, do the rational thing. Check it out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Pizza. Pizza available.